The following story is based on the records of the United States Air Force, the files of the Hayden Planetarium, and the actual transcripts of the tapes made by Betty and Barney Hill under hypnosis by Dr. Benjamin Simon. The purpose? To penetrate an extraordinary case of double amnesia, precipitated by their claimed sighting of a UFO in 1961. Side road, dirt road, dead end, and there's no road, there's no no clearing, nothing. Of course there is, we just haven't found it yet. Left or right? I don't know, let's try right. I saw the thing. I knew I saw the thing. But if my best friend told me he'd seen it, I'd say he was crazy. Benny, there have been UFO sightings all over New Hampshire. Are you saying they're all nuts, all those people? Maybe, yeah, maybe. And it's crazy to keep coming back here. It's like a, like a compulsion, like some of those people you deal with at work. Compulsive gamblers, compulsive wife beaters. What does that make us, compulsive travelers? What's so bad about that? Because we only traveled to Indian Head. We only traveled Route 3, looking for a road that doesn't exist. How many times have we been back here, Betty? Seven, eight times. You always end up exhausted and fighting each other. I don't want to fight with you, Betty. Let's not come back. Let's just decide not to come back again. Ever. But, but we will, we you will, know. You know. Oh, it's funny how we do that. Say the same thing at the same time. Just a little tolerance, that's all I ask. I saw the men in the road. And then I saw the moon sitting on the ground. Dreams are dreams and reality is reality. We almost smashed up this car because you had a dream. Don't do that, Barney. Please. Don't shut me out. Talk to me. Tell me what you feel. I feel that your dreams are dreams. And the reality. about. I wasn't scared you were. Oh, don't do that, Barney. You were too. I saw your face before. And just now. 
I was brought up to be careful, remember? It's like an old, scratched, broken record playing inside of me. Be careful, kid, or they'll kill you. Marrying me wasn't being very careful, was it? I loved you so much, I forgot to be careful. First time in my life, throughout careful. What are we going to do? How do I know this thing happened? How do I know I wasn't just seeing things? I'm in this terrible position where I know it happened, but I can't get myself to believe it. And it's bugging me so much that my ulcers are kicking up again. This one, they were getting better. It's worse than that. I'm trying to minimize. I was out of work for six months on disability. And the doctor said I was suffering from the complete physical exhaustion, anxiety. And Betty, Betty was having those nightmares, sudden fears out of nowhere, things that are really not like Betty. She's so calm. And it's been almost two years since the experience? Yes. I keep trying to remember what happened, where we were. There's a whole area that's lost, 36 miles in there, between the time we saw the UFO or whatever and, and when we heard the beeps. Now, Concord's about where you heard the beeps. Uh, it's a beeping sound. Beep, beep, beep. Is there something shifting in the car? I don't know. Uh oh. Do you think that thing is back again? How strange. Wait a minute. I wonder if I can make the car do that myself. Uh, it was at this moment, the uh, beeping, when your memory returned. It's a time previous to this that you can't remember. Yes, Dr. Simon, that's right. I see. We go back there. Weekends, holidays, whenever we get a chance, we were just there a couple of days ago. The two Indian head, you mean? Yes, trying to find... Uh, a sort of woke up from a daze and... I saw the sign, Concord, 17 miles. Suddenly, Concord. It was so strange. Barney and Betty Hill began general history of their anxiety problems and amnesia, highlighted by their claimed sighting of a UFO at Indian Head two years ago. The Hill's clearest memory is their return home from the UFO sighting experience. Treatment is to be centered on their anxiety reaction with their apparent amnesia. Unidentified flying object, secondary matter. Major job is to determine treatment of patients in overcoming this unique case of double amnesia, most probably by means of hypnosis. Barney Hill, 39, works for the post office, is a distinguished member of NAACP, and active in community affairs, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Well-read, educated, IQ of 140. Previously married, two children suffers deep guilt about leaving marriage and children, but sees them as often as he can. Also suffers from childhood of racial strife.
Betty Hill, 42. Comes from an old New Hampshire family dating back to 1629. Previously married, 13 years, two adopted children, now grown. Returned to university after divorce, received degree, presently works as welfare worker for the state of New Hampshire. He has a background of security in both upbringing and heritage. Fanny? Fanny, did you take the clothes in the house? What? The clothes, did you bring them in? No, I was too tired. I'll bring all that stuff in tomorrow. I don't want you to bring the clothes in the house. About the clock, you said you glanced up at the clock as you were undressing. Did you see the time? I saw that it was five after five. Didn't register. I don't think Barney realized it either. Neither one of us realized till months later that it was that late. Wasn't that strange, Barney, whatever it was? Tops of my shoes are scuffed. What? Tops of my shoes are scuffed. I don't understand. How could that be? I don't know. Now, now, Mr. Hill, when you woke up the next morning, did you experience any particular discomfort on your groin? No. It was there. I could... Uh, just, just had a feeling. There was no pain or anything. Well, how much later was it that the, the warts appeared? Oh, uh, two months, I guess, before they actually appeared, before I actually saw them. Cause they, I had a feeling before they actually appeared. So you went to the doctor and he diagnosed it, and by means of electrolysis, he was able to get rid of them. Yes, sir. And you haven't been in trouble with them since? No, I haven't. I see. Uh, please, continue. Betty. I don't want to talk to anybody about last night, all right? All right. I guess. If you want to talk about it, we can just talk about it to ourselves. But we can't just not talk about it, you know. I know that. I, I want to talk about it to you. I don't like feeling alone with this thing. You're not alone with it, love. How could you be? You're not alone with it, love. How could you be? And we wondered about it, and we talked about it, and then I asked Barney if he thought we could draw what we saw, and he didn't want to do that. But Betty found a way to talk me into it. <laughs> well, I'm good at that. And then when the drawings were identical, well, Barney thought they were only similar. I wanted to call my sister, and Barney didn't want me to do that. He got angry. And then when she wanted me to check for radiation, Barney got really upset. Where's the compass? Where's the compass? I don't know what you're talking about, Betty. The compass, the compass, where's the compass? I don't know where it is. How am I supposed to know where the compass is? Barney, you're a big help. It's in the drawer where it always is. 
Why don't you look before you ask? It's always there in the same place. Betty, listen. I think you're getting too excited about all, all this, and I think you better calm down. I think we just better forget about all this. Bonnie, would you please come outside and look at the back of the car and see what happens to this compass? Janet says a compass works like a Geiger counter. And if the car has any radiation... Oh, Betty, it's all so ridiculous. A car is made out of metal, and any metal would attract a compass. The compass just went crazy. Near the trunk, the spare tire. Not near the battery, or where you'd expect it to. And there were these strange, shiny spots on the back of the car. I finally got Barney to come out and look at them. I figured if I humored her and looked, she'd calm down. Or did the spots stay on the car? No, no, they disappeared. They didn't disappear. At least not right away. What happened is that when I had the car washed, it they stayed. All right. Now, let's go on. Janet, it went crazy. Yes, the compass, and there were strange spots on the back of the car. I couldn't call anybody. <laughs> they laugh at me. No, I'd be embarrassed, and Barney... <laughs> Barney and I decided not to tell anyone, not anyone else. Were you able to deal with that, to, to live with that? Yes. Well... Yes and no. You see, so much of our life was so happy. We'd only been married about a year. And so many things were new. Especially for Barney. Uh, why especially for Barney? Well, the only change in my life was that I was married to Barney. I lived in the house where I'd lived for years. I had the same job and the same friends. But for Barney, for Barney, everything was different. He lived in Philadelphia in what was really an all-black society. And, and here in Portsmouth, it's pretty much an all-white society. It wasn't just a new marriage for Barney. It was a whole new life and new friends. <laughs> Barney makes friends so easily. Our best friend, Sam, were Jack and Lisa McCraney. Jack's a lieutenant colonel at the Peace Air Force Base, and he and Barney just hit it off. I knew Barney wanted to tell Jack about what we saw. And he kept putting it off. But I finally came out with it. The sighting, if it was a sighting, it was still gnawing away at me. The sighting itself? No. Whether or not there was a sighting, and whether or not I was... Uh, we were seeing things. And Jack just confirmed my suspicion. He said in so many words that uh, anyone that said they saw a UFO was nuts. And that only made things worse, you know. They were our best friends. They were around all the time. We could talk to them about anything, anything at all, except UFOs. That subject was just plain taboo. And those terrible dreams were starting. Had you told Barney about your dreams yet? I'd mentioned them. He had so little time. Barney was working nights in Boston. 60-mile drive back and forth. We were, except for weekends, we were sort of passing in the hallway. It's the moon, you idiot. What are you barking at the moon for? Yes, well, I imagine they were long nights for you. Hard on you. Very long. I keep saying this, though, you know, that we were having so much fun. Barney had joined the Toastmasters because he thought he couldn't speak in public. <laughs> and he found out he could. <laughs> then he found out he could make people laugh. The house was filling up with old jokes books and old routines on records. And <laughs> He'd spring them at the worst possible months. Not so fast, Rodriguez. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
honey, just sit down. You'll be late. <laughs> Bossy little thing, isn't she? You never knew she was the oldest of five children. Just grew up bossing everybody. Do me a favor, Bonnie. <laughs> Wouldn't you really like to sit down? <laughs> Call off your dog, <laughs> Bossy. <laughs> Yeah, just like that, it would change. Everything would get terrible. Like that night, Jack and Lisa were having their problems. Lisa knew we thought we had seen something. Somehow we got onto Barry Goldwater. Goodness only knows how we got onto Barry Goldwater. I heard myself saying, "You know, you know, the trouble with you white people. The trouble with you white people." Don't call me, you white people. Don't ever call me, you white people. You can say those white people, but don't include me, Barney Hill. I'm not white, I'm human. Well, I didn't ever say that again. <laughs> no, you didn't. And then they were... Getting ready to leave, Bonnie, too, because he had to be at the post office by nine. And when they all were saying goodnight, you could have cut the tension with a hatchet. My fellow citizens, let no one doubt that this is a difficult and dangerous effort on which we have set out. The path we have chosen for the present is full of hazards, but it is the one most consistent with our character and courage as a nation and our commitments around the world. And then Bonnie came back, he said he was going to call in sick. He was so worried and he was just lying there with this white cloth over his face to help his headache. Better? Not much. Bonnie, I want to ask you something. I can't, not with that thing over your eyes. <laughs> it was your idea. This probably isn't the time, anyway. But I really wanted to ask you. Listen, Betty, I was just listening to the news. Bonnie, I said I wanted to ask you something. This is important, Betty, really important. If they actually do start shooting missiles. Who? Nobody's going to start shooting missiles, if Bonnie. If they do, and we're not together, if I'm at work and can't get here, now listen to me. What I want you to do is make your way to your mother's house. And I'll manage to get there. Is that clear? Yes. Yes, sure. Good. Bonnie, what I wanted to ask you before was how come we can talk about this UFO business together and wonder what it was together? But with Janet, with Jack, it was a plain period. With you, I can look like a fool. But with my friends, I can't afford to look like a fool. I got to hate that washcloth. More and more, he'd just lie there with it over his face. Just kept calling in sick. Well, I was sick. The ulcers, the headaches. Yeah, I was worrying. I mean, I've always been a worrier, but this is really getting out of proportion. I'm worrying about things that I didn't have any control over. I really thought we were going to be attacked. By whom? I don't know. Well, I thought Russia, but I don't know. And were the nightmares continuing, Betty? Yes, on and on. I started writing them down. I'd get up in the middle of the night and write till I was exhausted. I had done that before. When, when things upset me, I would write them down. It would help. You uh, still have a copy of those dreams? Yes, I stuck them away somewhere. You know, that's funny. I... I had forgotten I wrote them down. Of course, I'd uh, like a copy of them, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. I'll look for them. 
And it was about this time, Barney, that you, you went to see the doctor and he suggested that uh, you take a rest, take a sick leave. Yes, it was about this time. <clears throat> so I just started staying home, uh, trying to relax, work in the garden, read, stuff like that. The kids came more often. You know, I could see them uh, more often. They really liked Betty. I mean, they, they got along well with her. They really loved her. Because <laughs> I used to tease her. Right? I told her that it was her cooking they loved. <laughs> but, uh, mainly, I was just lying around and reading. Reading UFO books. What's the matter? Are you upset? No, I'm not upset. Why? You weren't smiling. When you came in, you weren't smiling. I didn't notice. I did. Well, obviously you did, or you wouldn't be uptight about it. No, I'm not uptight. Sorry about that. I'm uptight. What about? Well, if I knew, if I knew, I wouldn't be lying around this house all day, would I? Wouldn't be reading these stupid books. My eyes are falling out until. What? Until I think I'm nuts as they are. When I asked you to marry me, you said you wanted a psychiatric evaluation. But don't laugh, you may have been right. Oh, what do you mean? I mean that you, your instincts may have been right. You may have sensed something. Oh, no, my love. Oh, no, you didn't understand. It wasn't you I questioned, it was me. And I couldn't tell you. Tell me what? I still can't. Listen, don't you know by now you can tell me anything? I'm not pretty. Who says? Nobody. It's something I know, something I've always known. I'm not pretty. And that's nonsense. And what's it got to do with a psychiatric evaluation of me? Oh, you don't understand. I was afraid. I was afraid you thought. You thought you loved me. You thought I was pretty because... <laughs> because I was white. <laughs> hey. <laughs> that's like... <clears throat> that's like me being afraid. You didn't love me. You only loved my beautiful black... Body. <laughs> All I do. Oh, well, <laughs> there's that too. You're right. You're not pretty. You're beautiful. And I see the whole world, Betty. I see every bit of beauty in the whole world in your face. <laughs> I see you, Betty. I love, I see you. Oh. 
is the way it should be. This is the way it was. This is the way it should be. This is the way it was. Well, finally, I convinced him that we had to report it. She cried. That, that's really what did it. Well, whatever did it, we did call. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't too impressed with how the Air Force handled it. But when uh, Wayne Webb from the Hayden Planetarium contacted us, then I knew that Betty was right. and that We had to tell everything we saw. No need for you to be concerned. No need for you to be worried. You are deeper and deeper asleep. You are deep asleep. You will remember everything, and you will tell me everything. It is now September 19th, 1961. You will remember everything, and it won't trouble you. Your memory is sharp now. I want you to go back to the time of your vacation in Montreal, beginning with the time you left your hotel in Montreal. Yes. I want you to tell me in full detail all your experiences, all your thoughts, all your feelings, beginning from the time you left your hotel. Now, uh, were you in Montreal? It was approximately 112 miles from Montreal. We were driving from Niagara Falls through Canada. Well, just go on. Tell me about your arrival there. The thoughts that were going through my mind was that would they accept me at the motel because would they say they were filled up and I was wondering if they were doing this because I was prejudiced. Because you're prejudiced? Because they were prejudiced. You run into this a lot, I take it. I have not actually run into being denied accommodation yet. You mean you worry about it? But I know that this does happen, and I am concerned. Did you tell your wife about your concern? Does she share it? I express it, but... She does not share my concern in this matter. Very well. Go on. We are riding around, and I'm lost. And I'm concerned about the toll gate customs. Why? I have a gun in the trunk of the car. A thirty-two pistol, and it is hidden in the well of the trunk of the car with the trunk mat over it. And I'm thinking, why did I do this? Why did I bring this gun along? And I know it is all my fears that I believe the hostility of white people, particularly when there is an interracial couple. Yes, well, go on. Your memory is sharp. Where are you now? Now, we're in the country part of New Hampshire on Route 3, and I'm thinking, I've got to get a hold of myself and not expect hostility when there 
it was no hostility there. And I look up through the windshield. I look up through the windshield of the car where Betty saw a star. Oh, that's funny. But I said, Betty, that is not a star, it's a satellite. Come on, Delcy, let's get up. Hurry up, Betty, so I can see. It's not a satellite, it's a plane. Bonnie, what kind of a plane is that? What kind of plane was it? It is right over my right, and it does not go where I thought it would go. Bonnie, I'm asking you a question. What kind of a plane is that? Oh, that's funny. It was... It was funny. They're coming around toward us. They're changing course. Just a... Piper Cub. Bonnie, it's not a Piper Cub. You saw a, a small plane. Bonnie, that's not a plane. It's still following us. Bonnie, where are you going? I just want to see it. Still there. It's coming closer. It is not. It is not coming closer. Just way up there. Betty, what are you trying to make me believe? All right. We'll stop here for now. Just relax. Be comfortable. Until you hear me speak again, you won't hear any sound here. Rest and be comfortable. All right, you may proceed now. And I am wondering why doesn't it go away? Do you still think it was a small plane? And I'm wondering why these pilots, why they shouldn't do that. They shouldn't do that. And I can't hear any noise. And I think this is ridiculous. I can't hear any sound. And I want to get back in the car and get out of there. I've got to get out of there. And it is still coming around towards us. And I look up and down the road. And I think how dark it is. And I think, what if a bear were to come out? And Betty is looking. I think she said, and I'm mad with her. I think Betty is trying to make me believe this is a flying saucer. And I am wondering, why doesn't it go away? I won't wake up. You won't wake up. You're in a deep sleep. You can go on. right over my right. What is it? I gotta get out of here. This won't trouble you. Go on. You're remembering everything now. And I try to maintain control so Betty cannot tell that I am scared. Oh, I am so scared. Go on. This won't hurt you. Experience it. It won't harm you now. <laughs> Ah!
I gotta get my gun! I gotta get my gun! I gotta get out of here! I gotta get my gun! I gotta get my gun! You're in a deep sleep. You can remember nothing. Now, now calm yourself. Calm yourself. Here, come on. Now, come on back. And sit down. All right. You can wake up now. All right. You can wake up now. And remember everything. Just go on remembering. There's no need for you to cry out. You're, you're calm now. You still feel you have to get your gun? Yes. It meant to harm you, you felt? Yes. And I open the trunk and I take it out and I put it in my coat and I look and I look and I say, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'll shoot it down. And, and I run out across the road. And there, there, there it is, up there. Amen. Amen. Is he a captain? What is he? And he's looking at me, and I say, no, I have to shake my head. This isn't true. This can't be true. And he's still there. And I look up and down the road, and I think, can't somebody come along and tell me that this isn't there? It's there. Are you sure it's there? Yeah. You're not having a dream. And I touch my right arm. It's, it's not my right, it's my left arm. And it's there. If I let my binoculars fall and dangle, maybe it won't be there. But it's there. Why? What do they want? What do they want? And this one person looks friendly to me. He's friendly looking. And he's looking over his right shoulder at me and he's smiling and he's friendly. But the other one with the evil face, he looks like a Nazi. He's a Nazi. Did he have on a uniform? Yeah, yes. 
Did they have faces like, like other people? His eyes are slanted. Oh, his eyes are slanted. Oh, I feel like a rabbit. What do you mean by that? When I was hunting for rabbits in Virginia, this cute little bunny went into a bush that wasn't very thick, and my cousin Marge was on one side of the bush, and I was on the other with a hat, and this poor little bunny thought he was safe. And it tickled me because he was just hiding behind this little stalk that meant security for him. And I pounced on him and threw my hat on him and captured the poor little bunny that thought he was safe. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I thought of that standing out there in the field. I'm that bunny. I'm gonna be pounced on. I'm that bunny. This creature is trying to tell me something. I can see it in his face. Are its lips moving? No. His lips aren't moving. But he's, he's looking at me and he's saying to me, don't be afraid. Did you hear him tell you this? No. You felt he said it? Uh, I know. And he said, just stay there, he said. And he's telling me not to pull the binoculars away from my eyes. And, and, I, 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 oh, God, give me strength. I'll fight it off. I'm not afraid. And I run out across the road, and there it is up there. Oh, those eyes. Oh, can I please wake up? Just a little longer. You'll get through this, all right. I don't understand. The eyes don't have no body. They're just eyes. Oh. Oh, that's what it's got to be. It's a, a wild cat up a tree. Oh, that's what it's got to be. <laughs> oh, I know. It's the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland. It disappeared too, and only the eyes remain. Oh. You don't seem to be frightened anymore. No, they're not gonna do anything bad. Just floating about. I'm that bunny. I've been captured, but just floating about. <laughs> it's so ridiculous, isn't it? Oh, really funny. I wonder where they come from. They're not going to do me any harm. I wish I could go with them. Oh, what an experience to go to some distant planet. Maybe this will prove the existence of God. Isn't that funny? to look for the existence of God on some other planet. Oh, <laughs> my
was laughing or crying, but he said to me, they were going to capture us. They're going to capture us. we got to get out of here. Look out, look out, you can see them. They're right overhead. They're right directly over our car. They're out there, I don't see anything. It's all black, I don't see them. What's that? What's that noise? I don't know. Now, just a moment. This was the first series of beeps. When your amnesia begins. I don't want to. It was the second series of beeps when your memory returned. I don't know. Well, you will remember. Clearly. But... Uh, uh, I... That... My mind... Uh, blank. I... But... Uh, but oh, I... I could not... I... Almost remember. You can. Remember. Oh, I... At this point, I can't get beyond those be beeping. You can. You can get beyond it. It's all right. You've never remembered it before. This is the two hours you could never remember until now. Because you're there now. It's all right. Go on. Remember. No need to be upset. I'm not supposed to. Not supposed to? Who told you you're not supposed to? They did. All right. You're calm. Calm. We're driving along. I don't know where we are. I, I don't even know how we got here. Barney and I, we we were driving. I don't know how long. I, I don't know how long. We haven't even been talking. I'm just sitting there. Feeling that something's going to happen. No, I'm not really too afraid. Except now I am. That time I didn't feel afraid. Why are you crying if you're not afraid? I'm afraid now. But then I wasn't. I don't. I wasn't. I wasn't afraid. I was afraid. I was afraid when I saw the man in the road. The man in the road? I've never been so afraid in my life before. Tell me about the man in the road. It's all right. You're safe here. Tell me about the man in the road. Betty, Betty, don't fall asleep. I want you to stay awake so you can remember. Tell me about the men on the road. I, I wasn't too afraid of the men. When I saw them, they were standing there. And I thought, oh, well, you know, they're not so awful. I, there was a, I, I don't know, there was, I wasn't too afraid when I saw them, they were, uh, they were just, no, I, I couldn't get a good look at them. <laughs> Maybe their car's broken down. What are they doing here? And then they 
started coming to us. And then I, when they did that, I got really scared. And finally tried to stop the car. And the weather. I was that? I, I, I didn't hear that. I thought if I could just get my hand on the door of the car and open it. I can run into the woods and hide. And Bonnie is yelling. They're going to capture us. They're going to capture us. They're coming closer. Oh, my. Oh, oh. They're coming closer. I, I, I just put my, my hand out. I put my, my hand in the, on the door of the car. And I'm going to open it and... They open it for me. <laughs> they open the car door. This man, this man, this man. There's two men behind us. So there, one, two, three, three men. And there's one, two more men behind them. <laughs> All right. All right. You'll stop there for now. You'll be relieved and relaxed. When you wake up, you won't remember anything that's transpired here. You won't remember anything until I ask you to record it. All right. You'll be comfortable and relaxed and at ease. your Mayflower ancestors. Mm. 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 Now, how could I go and marry a girl with no class? No, Betty, Betty, no. Not that, no, Betty. Not, not, not that, no, anything but that, no. <laughs> <laughs> Serves you right. No class. You're really feeling good, aren't you? Yes, I am. <sighs> Just... Minutes. I really feel good. I come out of those sessions. It's like a weight lifted. And I don't know what the weight is, but something's working because there are these minutes before it all comes creeping back again. <laughs> With me, it's a day or so. <laughs> and then I can't wait for the end of the week to get back in there. <laughs> like today, at lunch, I felt so cool, I had an onion with my hamburger. Banny, you know we said we wouldn't eat onions unless we both had them. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. I'll get you one. What? I'm gonna get you an onion. Oh, <laughs> I don't want an onion, you lunatic. <laughs> it's really strange, isn't it? It really is. So amazed. So curious. Just dying to find out what's going on in there. So am I. It's amazing. I didn't think I could be hypnotized. It's so unlike me. Just have to be in control all the time. But I, I walk in there and bang. I guess I trust him. Hmm, me, Barney Hill trusting somebody. Except me. And him. Yeah, it's funny, I trusted him right away. So did I. Oh, yeah, but you're used to trusting people. You know me, 
I'm not paranoid. It's just the whole world is out to get me. <laughs> Especially boys with ducktail haircuts and old ladies. The ladies? <laughs> what, are you kidding? Yeah, sort of. No, not really. My earliest memory, except that I don't think it was really a memory, just that my mother told the story so much that I feel I remembered it. I was just a baby, six months, nine months, and we moved into an all-white neighborhood in Philadelphia. And my mother put me out on the porch in a carriage. She came out just in time to see an old lady sneaking across the porch with a pot of boiling water, and she was going to dump it on me. Oh. Yeah. You're not crazy. Well, I don't know. Maybe it didn't really happen, but... Oh. I grew up on stuff like that. All those summers in Virginia. I remember my uncle and all the men on the farm sitting up on the porch all night with the loaded guns. And all night, because they were coming. They said they were coming, but they didn't come. I know. No. I don't know. Oh, there's no way I could ever know, is there? No, thank God. <laughs> My fears? You know, it's odd. My fears aren't ever of the real. You know, it's, it's what I don't know. The unknown. Death? Lost time and... <laughs> really, the unknown. Mm -hmm. It's not that that frightens me. It's not being in control. The idea of not being in control. Will you promise me something? If I get a stroke, something like that, that paralyzes me so I can't... Would you put a pillow over my face? That's not fair, Bonnie. Bonnie, that's not fair to ask me a thing like that now, to ask me to promise. All right, don't promise now, but if. Just decide then, knowing. Hmm? OK, I'll decide then, <laughs> when you're 102. It runs in the family, you know, strokes. And I truly am scared. I would have told you about that and asked you about that before, but I didn't want to frighten you. Will you be all right? No. No, I wouldn't be all right. Oh, baby, don't cry. I didn't mean to make you cry. Yes, you did. You did. Everything was just fine. We were laughing. We were fine. You had to spoil it. You had to. I'm sorry. Oh. I know. I know. So am I. Oh, we're always sorry. We keep right on doing it, and we're sorry. Why? Oh, will we ever know why? Go on, Betty. Why? Oh, will we ever know why? Go on, Betty. It's all right. You can go on now. 
I... I don't know what happened. You can remember everything now. What did these men look like? Did you see their faces? No. How were they dressed? Did they have on a uniform or ordinary clothes? I couldn't say. I don't know. I can't remember. I'm not supposed to remember. All right. Your memory is sharp now. You needn't worry. You can remember everything. Now tell me what happened. What are you thinking now? I'm thinking I'm asleep. Asleep in the car? I'm asleep and I've got to wake up. I, I don't want to be asleep. I keep, keep trying to wake up. And then I do, I open my eyes. I'm walking through the woods. I open my eyes quick and I shut them again. And Barney is behind you? There's a couple of men behind me and then there's Barney. There's a, there's a man on each side of him. And my eyes are open, but Barney's still asleep. He's walking and he's asleep. And then I begin to get mad. And I said to myself, who the heck are these characters and what do they think they're doing? And I turn around and I say, Barney, wake up. Barney, why don't you wake up? And I'm getting really annoyed at Barney. And I say, Barney, wake up. Is Barney his name? And I wouldn't answer. And then the leader, there's no reason to be afraid. We just want to do some tests. And then when the tests are over, we'll take you and Barney back to your car. You'll be on your way back home in no time. And then come to a clearing. And there was, oh, I wish it were light so I could get a better picture of it. There's a ramp to the door. The object was on the ground, the moon sitting on the ground. The object was on the ground? I think that's the same one I saw in the sky. And I thought it was the moon. We go inside, and there's a, there's a corridor to the left. In the corridor, there's a room. Peter spoke English, it's in the room. And then another man comes in. I haven't seen him before. I think he's the doctor. And they both look through this machine here and here. What do you think they were doing? I, I have an idea. They're, they're taking a picture of my skin. They're doing all kinds of things. And then they, they took something like a letter opener, only it wasn't, and they scraped my arm here. And then they put the little skin scraping in a piece of cellophane or plastic, something like that. And oh, then they feel my hair at the back of my neck and take a couple of strands and pull it out and the examiner tells me to take my dress off before I even have a chance to stand up to do it. Your dress has a zipper down the back? Yes, it zips down the back. The examiner unzips it and slips my dress off. And they're talking. I, I, I don't know what they're saying. I couldn't understand that part. I want to do some tests. I want to test your nervous system. I don't know how our nervous systems are, but I hope we never have nerve enough to, to go kidnapping people off the highways as you've done. I'm lying on the table. 
I don't know what they're doing, but they seem so happy with whatever it is they're doing. And they touch me with a needle. Doesn't hurt. It's something like a TV screen. And then they tear me on my stomach and then back over on my back. And I see the doctor has a long needle in his hand. Go on. Go on, it's all right. What are you going to do with that? And he tells me that it won't hurt. He just wants to put it in my navel. It's just a simple test. Tell him it's hurting, it's hurting. Take it out. And the leader comes, he, he, put, he, he rubs his hands over my eyes and says it will be all right. I won't feel anything. The pain's gone away, but uh, still sore when put that needle in. I don't know why they did that, because I told them they shouldn't do it. Did they make any sexual advances to you? No. I asked the leader, I said, why did you put that needle in my navel? He said it was a pregnancy test. And I said, I don't know what you expected, but that was no pregnancy test here. When you had all of these experiences with your dreams, why would you have dreamed all these things? The dreams were the same as the experiences that you felt you had? I figured that in my dreams, I remembered what actually happened. Did these men speak to you? Only the one I thought was the leader. What kind of language did he use? He did not speak a word. I was told what to do by his thought, his thoughts. And I was always aware that somehow there was something peculiar, which is the absence of a mouth. There seem to be indications that a great deal of the experience was absorbed by Barney Hill from Betty, in spite of his insistence that this was his own. And there are definite indications that her dreams had been suggested as a reality. The implications are self-evident. Go on, it's all right. And so then I said, I asked him where he was from. And he asked me if I knew anything about the universe. And I told him, no, I knew almost nothing. But don't judge this country by me. There are people who do know all about the stars. And there was this one big circle, and it had a lot of lines coming out from it. And then to another circle, quite close, but not as big. Do you think you could draw the map? Yes, I think so. He said... These were places they went to occasionally, and the broken lines were expeditions. And I asked him again where his home port was, and he said, where are you on the map? And I looked, <laughs> I laughed, and I said, I don't know, and he said, if you don't know where you are, there isn't any point of my telling where I am from. Or did they actually speak English? I've been telling myself I heard them in English with an accent, but I don't know. Could it have been thought transference? 
No. I knew what they were saying, and they knew what I was saying, but if it... I knew what they were thinking. I knew what they were thinking. forget about it. You can take the book, but you can never, never, never make me forget. I'll remember if it's the last thing I do. suppose it was because your skin and Bonnie's skin were of a different color? I don't know. I think it's because their skin and mine were different. And I started to get out of my car, and I felt myself supported by two men, and my eyes were closed. Now, just a minute. Didn't Betty tell you this? No. Betty never told me this. But didn't she have dreams of this and talk to you about them? Betty said that we were inside a UFO in her dreams, not how we got there. Yes, but didn't she tell you that you were taken inside? Yes, she did. Well, then she told you everything that was seen inside and about being stopped by these men? No, she did not tell me about being stopped by the men. She did not have this in her dreams. I saw this. I've, uh, I've got a problem. As I see it, there are four possibilities. One, they're lying. I, mean, I can discount that because they're honest people, high integrity. Two, there's a case of dual hallucination. Well, it's improbable for reasons I won't go into. And three, the incident was a dream or an illusion. Now this, I intend to explore further. What makes you think it was a dream? Well, I didn't say I thought it was a dream. I said I'd explore it further. You know, I remember you saying exactly the same thing about a young lady in freshman biology that you uh, thought you were in love yeah. with, that you wanted to explore that. All right, all right. Now, the reason I'm going to explore it further is because a background existed. A sensitized background existed on which a fantasy could be imprinted to be experienced later as a dream. Uh, now, hold it, man. You lost me. Yeah, well, forget about that. I can't discuss the personal aspects of this. But what I really want to know is, is the sighting of a UFO probable? More important than that, has there ever been an actual case of a, an abduction aboard a UFO? Is, is that possible? Uh, do you want the official Air Force position or...? Uh... Well, I want whatever you can tell me. All right. The official position is, we don't know. Well, you think you could take that a step further? Yeah, but not too much. Because each year, after investigating about 1,500 reports of UFO sightings, we've come up with a 95% explained natural phenomenon. I mean, balloons and things. Balloons, weather inversions, kooks, and 5% unexplained. Now, that unexplained is never denied. We just file it under the heading of insufficient data. But Ben is a friend, I'll tell you. 
I wonder about that 5%. There are just too many reports, good people, sound people, and we can't, we can't seem to find any answers that make any sense. So as for the sightings, yeah, I really wonder about them. But for an actual abduction, now that I never heard of. And offhand, I'd say that it's extremely unlikely. No, no, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, I think a sighting is possible. But an abduction? Then I'd have to have an awful lot of proof, an awful lot of facts. So you're saying that without the facts, you'd consider it highly improbable, even impossible? Um, yeah, Ben, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Barney and Betty Hill have hypnotized each of them separately, and each of them separately remembers in general the same experience. I suspect that in this stage of therapy, the sighting of an object, which could possibly be a UFO, triggered an externalized fantasy, a fantasized trauma which the hills have projected their inner turmoil. I just had a hysterical thought. What if Dr. Simon were a spaceman? Oh, Betty, don't be ridiculous. Neither Barney Hill nor Betty Hill realize that their experience, as described, is almost identical to the long report that she wrote about her dreams. If he changes his mind and decides not to let us start listening today. Of course he's going to let us listen. He said so. Oh, Barney, don't be ridiculous. If he changes his mind and decides not to let us start listening today. Of course he's going to let us listen. He said so. So he asked me, what are vegetables? I just couldn't explain what vegetables are. And he said, was there one kind I liked? And I said, my favorite was squash. And he said, tell me about squash. So I said it was it was yellow usually, and he said, "What's yellow?" And I started looking around the room, and I couldn't find anything yellow at all. Now I I want to read something to you. He asked questions. What did vegetables look like? My favorite one, squash. What did it look like? I tried to explain the color of it and looked for some yellow coloring in the room, but could not find any. It's from my dream, but I wrote down. Yeah, well now, I want to explain something to you that you probably know already. The rules that operate for the conscious mind don't operate for the unconscious mind. Things are and are not all at the same time. Now, under hypnosis, what a subject believes determines what is truth to him. Wait a minute, would you say that again? Well, in other words, what comes out under hypnosis, you believe to be true. It is true for you. But a fantasy or a dream can be as true for you as reality. I said I hoped that somehow we would meet again. Maybe he would come back. And he said, well, he would try. And then they all turned and started to go back. And I get up to the car, and Barney's inside, and I say, come on out and watch him leave. Don't be afraid, Delcy. There's nothing to be afraid of. And so we're watching them leave, and it starts glowing, getting brighter and brighter. It's a large ball, a big orange ball, and it's glowing and rolling just like a ball. And I'm so happy. Suddenly, the ship became a bright, glowing object, and it appeared to roll over like a ball, turning over about three or four times, and then sailing into the sky. 
There's one thing I don't understand. Suppose it was a dream. Could we have both had the same dream? Well, that's an aspect that's been puzzling me, and uh, no, I don't think you could. At first I thought, because Barney was more ready for a trauma, that he had transferred a fantasy to you. Then I thought, because it seemed more likely, that you had transferred your dreams to Barney. Because Barney is more susceptible. <laughs> Well, I'm not quite sure how to take that. But <clears throat> I'll tell you something. I don't really care if it's a dream or real, because the longer these tapes play and the more we listen to them, the deeper and deeper we get into it, I feel as though something is being lifted off my shoulders. And it's better than suffering with it, you know? And all those anxieties and wondering. That's the whole point. The point is to relieve the anxieties. How do you feel now, Betty? I feel fine. I, I guess it was just the fear of the unknown had me so scared. And I don't want to be operated on. You don't want to be operated on? What makes you think of an operation? Oh, I just remembered something. I don't know if I went into this detail or not when I was hypnotized. What detail? Well, as I was listening to myself... Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's just psychological. I don't want to hear any more of that for a while. Uh, what detail? As I was listening to myself, I remembered what they examined my drawing with. It was a circular instrument, and they pressed down with it. You know that small ring of warts that developed in an almost geometrically perfect circle around my groin? Since the therapy began, it's become a little painful, inflamed around the whole area. And I was wondering, those warts originally appeared way back in 1962 when I had no conscious memory of the events aboard the craft, right? Now, here it is, 1964, and they get inflamed. How's that possible? I don't know. It may still be part of a shared fantasy. But I, I just don't know. up. You won't wake up. You're in a deep sleep. You can go on. And I look and I look and I say, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'll shoot it down. And, and I run out across the road and there, there it is up there. You experience it. It won't harm you now. <laughs> I gotta get my gun. I gotta you get my gun. Turn it off. No. I gotta get out of here. I gotta get my gun. I gotta get my gun. Yeah. I don't like them putting their hands on me. I don't like them touching me. It's all right, Barney. I'll just be calm. Mm. It's all right. Dr. Simon, I don't want to offend you in any way, you understand. I have a great respect and admiration for you. And I can only thank God that we came to you with all this. But your theory about a dream or fantasy, it's real. 
It did happen. I know that now. I know it. Dr. Simon, I haven't said before either how grateful I am. I just want to say, too, thank God we came to you with all this. Well, thank you, Betty and Barney. Thank you both. <laughs> I had the feeling, listening, that uh, I gave you a few bad moments there. Oh, I tell you. His little old heart went pit-a-pat a couple of times. You're a big man, Barney, and going for your weapon. Yeah. I had that gun in my coat the whole time. Can you believe that? Walking along, my eyes shut. Scared little bunny rabbit. And the gun in my coat, and you. You didn't have a gun, and you're half my size, and you're telling those creatures off. Mighty Mouse. <laughs> What in the world was I so afraid of? Betty, <laughs> you haven't had a good time. Well, what do you think? You must have given it some thought. The bunny, capture, bondage. Of any kind. Yeah. Of any kind. The dark. The dark? Well, that's all I did, you know. A child is frightened of his dark bedroom. You lead him slowly, gently into that dark, frightening room. Let him touch all the corners, all the objects that seem like monsters, until he knows that those corners are just corners. And the monsters are just chairs and lamps. Dog bedroom, spaceship, or the mind. Hey, listen. The next time we go in the dark together, will you please, for Pete's sake, tell me to keep my eyes open? <laughs> I did. You didn't listen. I will. Next time I will. With active treatment discontinued, Barney and Betty Hill settled down to their routine life. Betty Hill's schedule as a social worker for the state of New Hampshire was both demanding and rewarding. Barney Hill continued in normal fashion at the post office department and increased his community and political activities. He served on the board of directors of the United States Civil Rights Commission, the NAACP, and the anti-poverty program. As their doctor, I felt that their treatment had been successful. The primary purpose, to penetrate the amnesia in order to relieve their anxieties, had been accomplished. The question concerning the real or fantasized aspects of the trauma remains a question. <laughs> Daddy, you were so silly. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. Oh, so proud. Do you remember when we were in the middle of all that mess? We were fighting all the time about just everything. Well, I told you. No, well, first, you said that. Well, you know, you were talking about if you had a stroke. And, and you asked me if I would be all right. I remember. And I told you I wouldn't be. Well, Bonnie, that's not true what I said. I would be all right. <laughs> you know why? 
Because you've given me so much love, so much laughter, snatches of song. <laughs> Last the rest of my life. So I could be alone if I had to. And I would be all right. And you, you made up for every bit of unhappiness that I've experienced in my whole life. In 1963, under hypnotic suggestion, Betty Hill drew from memory the map shown to her aboard the spacecraft. Astronomers became fascinated, for what if the map corresponded to a pattern of real stars from an alien viewpoint? Astronomers reasoned that the majority of star systems likely to have life-supporting planets were located in the obscure southern constellation of Reticulum. Yet three stars in the cluster were unknown until 1969. No astronomer on Earth knew their position in 1963. But that same year, Betty Hill drew a map which contained these undiscovered stars. Astronomers at Ohio State University requested a computer to put them in their correct position out beyond the incredible double star system of Zeta Reticuli 1 and Zeta Reticuli 2, 220 trillion miles, 37 light years away from Earth, looking toward our sun. And the computer duplicated with virtually no variation the now famous map of Betty Hill. Thank <laughs> you. 